Next Saturday, June the 16th, Radio 4 is celebrating Bloomsday, the day on which James Joyce's great novel Ulysses is set, with a new dramatisation of the novel. Today we launch the event with a special edition of the programme in which David Owen Norris discovers the favourite music of great names from the past. So over to David to reveal James Joyce's playlist. I'm on the coast just south of Dublin on top of the Martello Tower where the 22-year-old James Joyce spent six nights that seared themselves into his memory and changed the course of literary history. And there's the view that Joyce describes in the opening scene of his great book, Ulysses. The snot-green sea, the scrotum-tightening sea. But that summer of 1904, Joyce's mind wasn't on great literature. He was actually trying to become a professional singer. And he never stopped singing, so it's no wonder his books and his life were full of music. This tune, Love's Old Sweet Song, was one he never got out of his head. It appears again and again all the way through Ulysses. I'm here to discover James Joyce, the musician. Down in the heart of the Martello Tower are three people who are going to help me imagine some of the music that James Joyce would have had on his iPod, the soundtrack of his life. First, Declan Kybird, the eminent Joyce scholar, author of Ulysses and Us, the Art of Everyday Living. Declan, this is a spartan little whitewashed room, just a camp bed and a hammock in the corner, a couple of bottles of beer on the shelf next to the oil lamp. Can you imagine Joyce and his two friends singing round this table? Yes, if they'd had a sufficient number of pints taken beforehand, which is, of course, eminently likely that they had. There's a story of how when they walked along the beach nearby, they met John Butler Yeats, father of the great poet and the great painter, and asked him for money for drink, and he refused absolutely. I think when they came back here after their tears in town, yeah, you could imagine them singing a few old songs as, as they thought about the sea, and their tightening scrotums. <laughs> <laughs> and there's quite an acoustic in this room, so it would sound good for music. It would. It, it's, it's terrific. And uh, the whole idea of, if you like, three bachelors creating a kind of alternative dwelling, a kind of bohemia, just at an angle to suburban Dublin with its puritanical and rather repressed people, you could imagine them trying, at least in their own heads, to let fly in here. And my second guest is the actor Barry McGovern. Barry, once a year you've climbed up to the top of the tower here and read a chapter of Ulysses. What's it like speaking Joyce's words? It's wonderful. I always think of of Joyce as a poet and as a musician. And um, like his his friend and fellow countryman Samuel Beckett, his words are like music and they're wonderful to speak. (laughs) And here's Catherine O'Callaghan, who's a specialist in Joyce and music. Catherine, that opening track, Love's Old Sweet Song, is a very old-fashioned favourite for a modernist writer like Joyce. It is. It's a very sentimental song, a sort of parlour song um, that Joyce would have heard during his his childhood. However, the way he uses the song within Ulysses um, is very experimental. He takes the lyrics of the song, first he introduces them to us, and then he intersperses them with the narrative throughout the book itself. By the end, we have Molly Bloom... Leopold Bloom's wife lying in her bed hearing a train whistle as it passes by and as she hears the sound it turns into the lyrics of Love's Old Sweet Song because she hears this sweet song um, in the whistle of, of the train as it passes by the house at night. So Joyce is blending the sounds of words with the sound of music in his book. Well Next for James Joyce's playlist, we've got a risque musical song, Those Seaside Girls. What's this all about? Declan. Well, Joyce associated the seaside with naughtiness, almost in the style of one of those Donald McGill postcards that came out later. He did once see a girl waiting, hoisting up her skirts on the beach in Dollymount, just across the bay from where we are now. 
The song refers to loose young women in Margate making themselves available. Joyce had a thing about the seaside, not just in Ireland, but in the south of England. He, he had a fantasy of going there, I think, and picking someone up. Uh, and there's no doubt that he projects this through many characters in Ulysses, including Bloom. The seaside seems to be the zone where the unconscious, the instinctual, suddenly emerges. And it's a splendid tune, Barry, isn't it, as well? It's a great song. It's a terrific song. It's a music hall song, and it's associated with lots of things that Joyce loved, like uh, girls' knickers and things like that, you know? Well, let's hear the girls' knickers. Gwyneth Herbert's recorded those seaside girls for us. Down at Margate, looking very charming, you are sure to meet those girls, dear girls, those lovely seaside girls. With sticks they steer and promenade the pier to give the boys a treat. In PK silks and lace, they tip you quite a playful wink. It always is the case, you seldom stop to think. You fall in love, of course, upon the spot. But not with one girl, always with the Lord. Those girls, those girls, those lovely seaside girls, all dimples, smiles and curls, your head it simply whirls. They look all right, complexions pink and white, they've diamond rings and pink. Defeat, golden hair from Regent Street, lace and grace and lots of face. Those pretty little seaside girls, those girls, those girls, those lovely seaside girls, all dimple smiles and curls, your head it simply whirls. They look all right, complexions pink and white, they've diamond rings and dainty feet, golden hair from Regent Street, lace and grace and lots of face. Those pretty little seaside girls. Those seaside girls. That summer that Joyce lived here in the Tower, 1904, was the most significant of his life. On May the 16th, he took part in a music festival competing in the tenor solo class. And this was part of his plan to become a professional singer. Barry. Well, his father was a, a singer. In fact, in um, a Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, there's a list of about 10 or 12 different professions, and one of them is an amateur tenor. Uh, he picked up a lot of this music from his father and from going to music hall type places. He, he loved low, vulgar opera, if you may put it that way, and music hall songs. His father enjoyed singing, mainly with his cronies, where he'd had a few jars on him. And there are many tales, especially when he was working in the distillery up in Chapel Lizard, where Finnegan's Wake is, in a sense, set where he knew the Broadbents in the Mullingar House Hotel there, where he had great nights of revelry singing after he'd had a few drinks on him. And I think his son must have picked up a lot of that from him. So Joyce comes from a family tradition of convivial singing, but at the music festival, the set piece, well, that was by Sir Arthur Sullivan, it wasn't from one of his jolly comic operas, it was an aria from the oratorio The Prodigal Son. Thomas Guthrie's recorded it for us. from Sullivan's oratorio, The Prodigal Son. Catherine, you can see why Joyce might hope that that would show off his voice, but he didn't win it, did he? No, he didn't. He won the bronze medal, in fact. 
It is said that when he was asked to sight read a piece of music following uh, the performance, he left the stage refusing to do so. This may have something to do with his notoriously bad eyesight, but may also have been due to the fact that he simply was not someone who could sight read uh, immediately in that manner and he was not prepared to let himself down. I think also you have to remember that it's likely Joyce was very, very shy deep down. One way of coping with the shyness was to be perhaps a musical performer, but I think even in that he sometimes might have broken. You know, people say acting is the shy person's revenge. I think performing music can be too. And uh, Joyce was awfully sensitive, and maybe he just walked off because his nerves could take no more. Joyce's sister said something about how he reacted to not winning. I think there was an idea that, that Joyce never quite recovered from this. I'm not sure how true that was. I think, to some extent, his life was always going to be about literature. And yet, throughout his texts, we have this ghostly haunting of another Joyce, one who was, in fact, a singer. We often have tenors within the texts themselves. And when it comes to Finnegan's Wake, we have twin characters, two parts of one whole, one who is a penman, Jim the penman, and one who is a postman, one who delivers, who's very definitely a tenor. So it's as if Joyce throughout his life had a secret haunting self who was in fact a tenor. Um, He was obsessed with a tenor called Sullivan when he was in Paris and he tried to further his career and of course his own son became a singer as well. So it continued to be a part of his life throughout his life. Well despite his disappointment at not winning the competition Joyce carried on with a few more gigs that summer and it's lucky that he did because it was while he was on his way to sing at a fate that he spotted a pretty girl across the street. Her name was Nora Barnacle, and the day they first walked out together was June the 16th, 1904, the day on which the whole action of Ulysses is set. Joyce thought that he and Nora might tour southeast England singing to his lute like ancient bards. Declan, that's almost beyond belief. Yeah, but you must remember that to an Irish person, as Oscar Wilde said, England is fairyland. It was a fantasy, but it was rooted in some kind of reality. Yeats had got very interested in Elizabethan musical instruments. He got a psaltery made by Arnold Dolmetsch. Joyce wanted Dolmetsch to make him a lute so he could perform Elizabethan songs. And this is the other side to the vulgar vaudeville. Joyce is is the lover of Elizabethan lyric. Didn't work out, but who can say it was a bad idea? Well, Barry, that's a bit of like that Joyce's own guitar lives here in the Martello Tower, and uh, you've brought it up to this room. Could we have a look at it? Sure. Oh. That's, not, that's no A, but I wonder what we'll, we'll, it's, it's, it's relative. It seems. Well, could, could you play something? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have a go. The song that, um, that Joyce uh, sang in August 1904... He shared a platform with John McCormick at the Ancient Concert Rooms where he sang a number of songs and one of them was Yeats's Down by the Sally Gardens. So I'll have a little I'll have a little attempt at that. Down by the Sally Gardens, my love and I did meet. She passed the Sally Gardens. With little snow white feet She bid me take love easy As the leaves grow on the tree But I, being young and foolish With her would not agree Well, there's Joyce's guitar now and my humble effort, so... (laughs) Barry, that was fantastic. So that's the song that Joyce sang in August 1904, and that's the guitar that he used to play in his later years. It's it's quite warm, a fingerboard. He obviously played it a lot. Yeah, it's very small, too, so it's quite difficult to play if you've... I mean, I I don't know, he must have... I know it very dainty feet. I don't know if his fingers were that dainty. (laughs) A lovely mother-of-pearl detail down Absolutely, there where the strings yes, are the, attached. The, the fretboard at the end, yeah. 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 Or not, the, not the fretboard, but the actual, whatever, that one at the very the end. The tail thing, tail isn't thing, it, where yeah, the yeah, strings yeah, are attached. Piece, yeah. And the, uh, the pegs at the other end, they're not those modern machine pegs that we see these days on guitars, are they? With little cocks, they're like violin they're pegs. Like, they are like violin pegs, yes, they are indeed, yeah. yeah but it's quite a dainty piece, yeah. 
And there's that wonderful picture of him holding it with, with great affection. That's right, that's right, yeah. He loved yeah, this guitar. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, all these plans that Joyce had, the wandering minstrel plan and the professional tenor plan, didn't really work out. And so instead, Joyce and Nora ran off to Europe, and Joyce made a living teaching English to foreigners in Trieste instead. On the way, Joyce quickly created the account to write what he called his obscene song to celebrate the unvirgining of Nora, Bid Adieu, and he wrote his own tune for it. So next on the playlist, a love song for his wife with both words and music by James Joyce, Bid Adieu. Bid adieu, adieu. Words and music by James Joyce. A beautiful song, Bid Adieu. Not really well known. I, I know, I've, I've only heard it once before, and um, uh, it's amazing that he didn't write more music because he certainly, obviously, had a talent for it, yeah. Declan? I, I think um, if she's saying goodbye to girlish days, he also said that Nora made a man of him. So his boyhood was kind of over at that moment. I think maybe the tenor plot and even the south of England seaside plot was implemented. If you think of Joyce as singing, because he hoped through it to pick up a good woman, he did. It's one of the great marriages in the history of modernism, and she was his muse. And, you know, it's a very moving song to hear in that context. So Nora, celebrated in that song, was so important to him, he couldn't have written perhaps what he did without her inspiration. Catherine? I think so. I mean, we return again and again in the text to Nora-type figures. I think Nora was essential to his creativity throughout his life as a support, and he, she was probably quite cynical about a lot of his writing and um, probably hurt his feelings by refusing to, to read his text. And yet, we can tell from his writing that, in fact, she was the one he returned to again and again, as his father, of course, famously said on hearing her name, Nora Barnacle. She'll stick with them. 
<laughs> well, and she must have forgiven Joyce a lot if she heard that beautiful song that he wrote for her. That, that, that was in that first published work, that collection of lyrics, Chamber Music, was it? Yes, yes it's one of the, um, it's one of the uh, poems in Chamber Music, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but he didn't write tunes for them all, as you said, Barry. But it, it's, it strikes me that, that all his writing, then, from what you're saying to me today, is a sort of sublimated music. It's all music, whether he wrote the tune or not. I think it's true that the strangeness of English to Joyce was connected with the fact that the Irish had their own language and he could use it like someone picking up an unfamiliar instrument and making strange new sounds out of it. A bit like African Americans did with traditional instruments to create jazz. I think there's a sense in which the newness in Joyce is possible because in a way the instruments he picks up and improvises with are strange. And that's a fascinating comparison with Joyce and jazz because jazz was beginning around about the same time that Joyce was writing Ulysses. Yeah, and I think there's an improvisational quality to both jazz and to prose passages in Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake. I don't know a lot about Joyce as a musician, but I suspect he was a very good improviser. There's a story that when he came back to Dublin on one of his trips, he and his father were both sitting at facing pianos and they couldn't really talk about his exile or the pain it caused the family. But the father just sort of sang, why did you go? And the answer was, I had to leave. And it's as if, to me, all the time in Joyce, something that is not really finally speakable comes out in music. Well, thinking about the music of words, we've got a clip here of James Joyce's own voice reading from his last novel, Finnegan's Wake. Well, you know, don't you, Kenneth, or haven't I told you, every telling has a tailing, and that's the he and the she of it. Look, look, the dusk is growing. My branches lofty are taking root, and my cold chair's gone ashly. Philo, Philo. <laughs> What, what, whatever else that is, it is not a Dublin accent. It sounds like a mixture of Eamon de Valera, Bernard Shaw, Count McCormack, and the few well-known Irish men of the time who had been near a microphone, all conflated in the dulcet tones of J. Joyce. I completely agree. I often wonder what he really spoke like, because I think that was a performance, and it sounds more like his father, a corkish kind of thing in a way, but it's extraordinary to hear. To my ear, which of course is not attuned to the niceties of the regional accents at all, what I hear there is extraordinary rhythm. I hear this fantastic rhythm, and then the melody of the voice going up and down. I could never have imagined it would sound like that. I thought it was extraordinary. I think it's wonderful to hear him read it. Um, this wonderful lilting voice which Joyce uses to evoke two washerwomen on either side of a river as night falls and they turn into a tree and a stone. I often use it when I'm teaching Finnegan's Wake because it is traditionally considered such a challenging text. And yet to hear Joyce, it is like listening to a piece of music because it simply is itself. We can enjoy it for its performance. We don't have to try and work out what each and every word means. So when he wrote, he was writing to be read aloud. There's no doubt. Joyce said, if anyone can't understand a line in my writing, just try reading it aloud. And if that doesn't work, change your drink. Absolutely. And as much as we're told that, Joyce famously said that if Dublin was burnt to the ground, you could rebuild it from the, the chapters of Ulysses. In fact, we're told very little about the visual Dublin in the book. It's all about the sounds of Dublin. That is actually what he captured, the voices of Irish people, the sounds that one can hear around the city streets, whether it is from the tower here and listening to the sounds of the sea, the sounds of the gulls. That is actually what Joyce has managed to capture in his text. Well, we seem to have come a long way from the 22-year-old James Joyce sitting in this Martello Tower and that extraordinary summer of 1904. The singing competition, the meeting with Nora, the September week spent sleeping in this very room and the October elopement to Trieste. But we've been listening to some of the music that filled his mind. What's been coming into your mind as you listened, Catherine? It was wonderful to hear Joyce's guitar played here, to hear the sound of his voice. It makes me think about the young man here who had so many adventures ahead of him that in the future he would encounter experimental music in Paris. Um, he would learn about the sort of avant-garde atonal music and yet he would carry the music of his childhood 
childhood and of his youth with him throughout his life and it appears again and again in his texts. So it's wonderful to bring ourselves back to that young man before he set out on his grand adventure. Barry, I think of Joyce very much as a poet and a musician and to me his words are music and no matter when I go back to him as I frequently do, I mean, Ulysses is definitely my all-time favourite book, I think, and I struggle with Finnegan's Wake from time to time. Joyce's words are word music for me. And Declan, you know this room very well, I know, but have you listened to music in it before? I've never thought about music in this room before, but listening to you all today and to Joyce, it strikes me he was forever taking old forms and finding completely new uses for them. He came to this tower, which was built by the British a century before his time to repel a French invasion, but he used it in a way to launch himself into the outer world, to continental Europe. He took one of Europe's oldest narratives, the Odyssey of Homer, and he made it into the experimental narrative of the 20th century. And it seems to me, like the people who invented jazz as well, he took many of the old musical forms and just made them sound a very strange and new thing, as if they were coming almost in at times from another planet. Well, it's been a wonderful time sitting here in this room, listening to you tell me all about James Joyce. My thanks to Declan Kybird, Barry McGovern and Catherine O'Gallaghan. But before I take a dip in that snot-green sea, we'll put one last piece of music on Joyce's playlist. Ulysses is full of singing, but Finnegan's Wake is actually named after an old Irish comic song where Timothy Finnegan falls drunk off a ladder and dies. But at his wake, a squabble amongst the women leads to a miraculous resurrection. This one's for the playful James Joyce, who loved to do his high-kicking dance at parties and was always ready with a song. Lots of fun at Finnegan's Wake. Miss Biddy O'Neill began to cry Such a pretty corpse did ever you see A raw little Finnegan and why did you die? Oh, none of your gab, said Judy McGee then Peggy O'Connor took up the job Arabidi says she, you're wrong, I'm sure But Judy then gave her a belt on the gob And left her sprawling on the floor Mickey Mulvaney raised his head When a gallon of whiskey flew at him It missed him and hopping on the bed The liquor scattered all over Finnegan Dad, he revives, see how he raises Finnegan jumping from the bed Cries while he lathered around like blazes Blimey, to your souls, do you think I'm dead? Oh, I can't can stay your partners Well, the floor, you truck just shakes on the floor. Isn't it the truth I told you? Lots, Lots of fun, fun at Finnegan 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 Finnegan's wake James Joyce's playlist was presented by David Owen Norris, who also arranged the music and played the piano. The singers were Gwyneth Herbert and Thomas Guthrie, with Camilla Scarlett on violin and Johan Loving on guitar. The producer was Elizabeth Burke. It was a Loftus audio production for BBC Radio 4.